Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, I would like to, for us to read the first 15 verses of that chapter. To paint the image I'd like for us to consider this afternoon. Verse 1 reads, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of gold shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way unto the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure of the time then present, in which was offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New, of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. As we consider these verses of chapter 9 in Hebrews, it should call to mind basically the different dispensations of how God has dealt with mankind throughout our history. Now this chapter is limited in beginning with the law of Moses, the period of this time for the, specifically to the Jews, but we must remember that under patriarchy they offered sacrifices in similar fashion. However, to the Jews it was much more ordered, it was much more of a deeper requirement. But then it focuses on the sacrifices made under the law of Moses, and that is the acceptable sacrifices that Israel was to make, and the priest specifically who offered them. And then it points to the one that would overshadow those things, which be Christ. Uh, verse 13, or really 12 and 13, points to the fact that blood of the bulls and goats could not fully remove sin, especially, specifically regarding the conscience. So these sacrifices, though uh, paled in comparison to the blood of Christ, still served their purpose. These were given by God, these commands that is, so they served a purpose. But then the blood of Christ, we read in verse 14, is able to purge our conscience from dead works, to fully allow us to serve God as he is commanded. But then it goes farther than that in verse 15. The blood of Christ even extended to those under the law of Moses, and furthermore to those under patriarchy. It says it brings the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. So not only does the blood of Christ save us today, but it also extends into the past. 
For those who were faithful unto the law of Moses, the blood of Christ cleanses their iniquity as well. So the point I'm trying to make here is God has ordained acceptable sacrifices throughout man's history. Under the law of patriarchy, it was animal sacrifice. Under the law of Moses, not only was it animal sacrifice, but also of their goods. A certain percentage of their livelihood was to be given and devoted to God. And then we see the acceptable sacrifice of Christ. He had no sin, but he died for us. It says he offered himself without spot to God. So he was God's acceptable sacrifice for those of the new, custom, the, the new covenant, the New Testament. But then today there is another acceptable sacrifice. And we find that in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're all familiar with this passage. Paul there penning, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says there that this is a reasonable service. It's logical. It follows, given the mercies that God has given to us through the gospel, that we should present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that's not saying our life is worship, because it's not. There's a difference between service and worship. We are always to be about our Father's business doing good unto others, spreading the gospel through his word. It's reasonable, it's work, but it's expected of us if we are to be faithful. This sacrifice is it's not meant to be easy. And the life of a Christian, furthermore, should never be robotic. It shouldn't be like a rut. Though it should be a routine, it shouldn't be something that we remove all emotion from, all of our our thoughts from, that we just do it because we've been programmed that way. It's something that actively requires our effort, our thought, our emotions, a fully engaged heart. Now some of these, these sacrifices might take the form of, of money. You think of the different needs of society today. Households that aren't functioning as God intends. Maybe they are, have absence of parents. Maybe they're absent of the daily needs that they have. You know, we're supposed to do good unto all men. Well, what happens if I was watching a video the other day, some stranger comes to the door and he's needing food. You're going to turn away because, well, mom only made four helpings of meat with some rice. No, come on in, we'll make some more. The idea he was, the video I was watching, the, the idea he was trying to, to point out was you make plenty enough for you to eat, but also if there's a stranger comes by, there's plenty enough food to go around. Now, obviously, if the stranger doesn't come, then you're set for the next few days, but you're prepared. You're always ready and willing to provide for the needs of others. And obviously, the spiritual need overshadows all of them. But sometimes the opportunity presents itself to take care of the physical side and then the spiritual. Obviously seeking both. Sacrifice, it's not meant to be something that's easy. It's meant to be something that means a lot to you. And this could be giving up some things. It should be giving up things. Think about this worship assembly. Folks could be at home, maybe catching a nap. I guess we're getting closer to the Super Bowl. There's football games on that I guess matter to some more than most. Could be watching those games.
One of my See, the Christian cannot do this. You cannot be fully, you cannot be wedded. Your goal, why not become a Christian this afternoon? To actually take the steps necessary to reach heaven as that goal. If you've allowed sin in your life as a child of God, why not make proper correction this afternoon? confess we'll pray for you pray with you either of these apply to you please make it known as together we stand and sing